Welcome to section four, maps. And in this section, we will look at what is a map. We'll understand the difference between declaring a map and creating a map. We'll look at how you can put values into a map and of course, get it back out because otherwise that wouldn't be very useful. We'll look at calculation, how many items are in a map. We'll look at how you can iterate over the items that are in a map. And so far, this sounds very much like slices at least and also like arrays, but we'll see the differences. And of course, how you can delete items from a map, which is one of the capabilities that maps give us that we don't quite have with arrays and slices. Of course, we'll kick off this section with lecture one. The great news is we only need one lecture in this section to cover everything we need to know about maps. Now, why is that? Well, it's not because maps are easier than arrays and slices or anything that we've covered so far. It's really because the order in which we've been covering things, it allows us to lay the foundation for what maps are. And as you will see, and from the previous topics that we'll cover, you'll see a lot of them sound like things that we did for array and slices. So when it comes to map, we sort of know it already. So we just have to look at the differences and syntax, for example. But before we start talking about maps, I want us to revisit arrays at a glance. If you wanted to declare or create an array, you'd say var, give it a name, and then you'd say how many items you want of a certain type in that array. Now with arrays, declaring and creating the array is the same thing, which means that when you declare an array, it already has space. And storing a value into array is very straightforward. We know how to do that. Retrieving a value, again, straightforward using an index, i, and it must be zero or more. It's written over an array, also is pretty straightforward using the for loop. And the range operator allows us to nicely traverse that array, all the elements of that array. And of course, we can use the length built-in function to get how many items are in an array. When we start down with slices, things look almost the same, except for this distinction between declaring and creating. We can declare a slice, and we know that what that does is it just gives us this sort of variable that allows us to point to an underlying array of the same type but we don't actually have any storage. In order to have some storage, we either have to create a slice by using the make function, or we have to slice an existing array or another slice. And of course, once we have a slice, now we can treat it like an array in terms of the same indexing rule applies where we can use an integer value greater than zero, but less than the size of that slice. And we can store and retrieve values. We can range over it. And of course, calculate the number of elements that you can store in that slice by using the linked built-in function. Very much the same as an array, except for the slight difference between declaring and creating. So that's a look at where we came from. Let's talk about where we're going. The formal definition for a map, and this I have taken from the Golang documentation, it says a map is an unordered group of elements of one type. So let's just parse the first part of the sentence. It's a grouping of elements of the same type. So similar to an array and a slice, all the elements must be of the same type. But instead of having an order, which is what you have with a slice and an array, the reason why we, we know that's order is because if you go to element zero and you traverse it in, you know, from zero to whatever the end, you're always going to get those elements in that order. That's not the case with a map. And we'll see what this means. So there's no order to how the elements are grouped. So it's an unordered grouping of elements of one type. And the type of the elements is the element type. Same thing as when we had array and slices, we have element type. Here's the other part. It says it's indexed by a set of unique keys of another type. That's really important. In array and slices, our index is an integer. We could not change it. It's built in. That's the way it's done. And not only was it indexed by integers only, and we couldn't change the index type, is that it had this limitation that the index value had to be greater than or equals to zero and less than the length of the slice or array. Here for a map, it's saying, hey, you can have a grouping of elements of one type, and then you can index or find those things using a different set of type called its key. So the keys, which is going to form your index, is can, can be an, another type. It can be an int or a string or anything like that. So a lot to digest here. And of course, we call this the key type. So we have two types we're dealing with. We're dealing with the element types, which are the values you want to store. And then we have the key type, which is what you're going to be using to get at those elements. And then it says the value of an uninitialized map is nil. This is where the declaration versus creating come in. 
and the distinction because just like slices, if you declare a map, that's an uninitialized map and the value of it is nil. You can still do things like take the length, but, and of course get zero, but you can't really try to store anything in it. It's not until you create a map, then you actually have storage allocated that you can put things in. So this still doesn't tell us exactly what a map is. This is the formal definition, but it doesn't tell us a map. So let's try and illustrate this. Let's say I have some cities and the corresponding states. I want a data structure that allows me to store this information so that if I know the city, I can figure out which state it's in. And as you can see, if you think this is sort of easy to do, think about in a case of Brooklyn and Manhattan, those two cities are within the same state. So I need a way, if I think of CD as my index, to be able to produce the value that is the state. So in this example, my city, which I want to use as my index, looks like it's a string. My state also, or the value, look like a string. Our index could be any type, and our value can also be a different type. And in this example, they happen to be both strings. But as you could see, this wouldn't work very well if I was using a slice or an array. Continuing with getting a picture of what's going on here, imagine CT is our index, and then we have a value like Brooklyn, and we want that to produce or to be tied to the state. So if I put in Brooklyn, I want that to be tied to the value of the state New York. And I want those two things to be treated as one entity. And if I think about having multiple of these things stored, I want them to be placed inside of what is, I'm going to call a map or however I want to think of the storage for this map. So the two things, the city and the state, while different, one is the index, the other is the value, or one is the key and the other is the value, I want them to be considered a unit and stored in this thing, a map. And of course, I should have multiple of them. So if I can do this, if I can store these entities in this container, if you like, I want to be able to say, well, when I'm ready to retrieve things, I should be able to present the city as my key or index, and it should go find the entity that that's associated with, and this is the entity, and produce the value, which is the state. In the example that we're doing, I want to be able to say Brooklyn is my key, and I want you to go find the entity in storage and produce the value New York. And if I provide you with Queens, for example, well, that should find another entity and if its value happened to be New York, well, great. It doesn't have to be, but in this case, we're talking about Queens, New York. And if I put in San Jose as my key, it should go find another entity and produce California. And so in this example, you can see I'm using strings to as my index and string as the output, but I don't have to do that. I could, in theory, use numbers as my input. And the difference here between a map and a slice or an array, think about what we're doing. If we wanted to just have the number 98 produce the letter or the string A+, plus, 95 produce the string A, 90 produce the string B+, plus, those are the only three things that are in a map. We couldn't do this with a slice. A slice and an array would require us to start from zero. And if we wanted to get an index of 98, well, we we'll just have to have at least 99 things. So that would be a waste of space just for the ability to be able to say that 98 gives me the value of A+. plus. We can see that our map looks like array and slices, but it seems to give you something else. Besides the idea that your index can be of any type or another type different than integers, it also that there's no order to it. We don't need to start from zero. We can start with 98. We can even use negative numbers if we wanted to because the index can be anything. There's no limitation that when you use an integer, it has to be zero because if it can be a string, it could be an integer, then it could be any integer. So let's jump to the code. As usual, I'm in section four, lecture one. Why don't we start with a slice so we can see the similarities? So declare the slice and just simply try to print out what the value of that slice is and the length. So let's run our code. And so it's an empty slice. Now I've shown you before that we can actually test for this and we can test against the nil value. And so that proves that just by declaring a slice, it has a nil value. So how is this different from a map? This says M is a map whose index type is string and its value type is string. It map is a grouping 
of elements of the same type so there's going to be a grouping of strings whose index could be of any other type call it key type so this is the element type or value type and this is the key type or index the thing we use it for index now before we get into the example with the cities and states let's use the example where we use an integer as the index and let's show the length of a map when you declare it then we'll create a map and put some values in it So same thing, I'll check to see if my map is nil and I expect it to be nil. And of course, when I run my program, I don't see anything. Well, because I want to display this map, I'll take this out, take out this check. And now let's copy this line. And before I rerun this, what I'll do is create a map. So here's our make function again. We saw the make function being used to create slices. Well, here at runtime, here we can use the same thing. And let's rerun this and see if we see anything different. And notice, in both cases, when we declare a map, we have a nil map. Its length is zero because there's nothing. And even when we declare a map, even though now I said that we have underlying storage for that map, notice how the length is still zero. It still looks pretty much the same. So let's put some values on our map now that we have created it. We can say map index is integer. Notice how for our map, we can use an index of minus one because our index is just an int. So now let's get the length of our map and it should be no surprise, we should expect to see three items. And there we go. We have three items and if we print our map, you can see here's the key. With a map, the index is also printed out because even if it's an integer, it can be any number and it doesn't have to start from zero. Remember from the formal definition, it says it's an unordered grouping. And notice when I rerun the program, look what happened. It changed the grouping, but you don't care about the order because you're not going through it in any sort of order like you would with an array or a slice. You simply care that all the values you put in there, the key value pair is stored. So I, I still haven't proven to you that when I declare the map, that there was no storage associated with it. So I checked and there's nil. And as you know, if something is nil, we try that with slices, it caused the program to crash. So let's do that here just so that we make sure that we've done both tests. So before creating the map, I'll try to assign something to M here is nil, it's an empty map. As I just declare it, it didn't create it. And so now when I try to assign, it should say no underlying storage. Well, it's not gonna say exactly that. It's just saying valid and it's gonna crash. It will crash the program. And as you can see, assignment to entry in nil map, right? There's no storage. Okay, so I'll leave that there as a comment in the code. And as you can imagine, retrieving value from a map is just as easy. And you simply give it a key and you get back what you should have stored for that key. Now, what if since map has no way of forcing you to use anything like a certain index or index within a certain range, how does the map know what's valid? For example, what if I try to retrieve a non-existing key? So here's an example. So in this case, let's put in 70. And what should we expect? Well, I'll run it and once you see the result, you'll see that it's consistent with how you would think a map should operate. And notice when we try to index with a key that we have, 98, we get back A plus, no surprise. But here we don't get an error. Even though our map does not have the key 70, we do not get an error. So what exactly did we get? So let's talk about that. Here I'm saying that my map key type is index and the element type is string. So if I ask my map to return a value or an element for a key that I did not put in, the map simply goes, oh, you know what? The default value of a string is just an empty string. So I can just return that. It's not there. I can return that. If let's say my value type was integer and I tried to get an index or use a key that wasn't stored, it would just return me the zero value of integer, which is just a zero. And for Boolean, well, false. So that is the way in which maps operate. Let's say I had a map of slices, for example, and I tried to use a key that I did not store anything. Well, it just returned me an empty slice of that type. So 
it's always the default value for that type. And in Go, everything has a default value. We can try that and see. So let's, for example, let's do a map one. Since I have a valid map that I can store things in, now let me create a slice that is a slice of string and store it in the map location. So this is somebody's last name, Smith. And maybe I'm using the last name as an index to find all the members in that family. And let's say there are four members in that family. So I create a slice. And since this would return a four element slice, I can index into that slice and store some value. It's a slice, so I have to use zero base indexing. So those are four members of the Smith family. So let's print that out. Now let's run the code. And as you can see, the Smith family, of course, we get back that slice with those values. What if I try to look up the Jones family? Now, if I look up the Jones family, it needs to return a slice of string. But since I did not store a slice of string, well, what is the default value for a slice of string if I declare it? Well, it's nil. So let me store that. This now contains whatever I get back from the map when I try to look up Jones. So now I can use that instead. I'll print out that value, which we should expect to see an empty array. And if I print the length of it, it should be zero. But I'm here, I'm also being explicit and testing it to show you that oh, I do get back a nil value. So let's run the code. And there we go. This is great that now we can try to get something from the map. And if we didn't store it, well, we get the default value. If our value type is an integer and we look up something that we did not store, we'll get back zero. But what if we did store zero? So it seemed like we need a way to differentiate between this value I'm giving you was in the map, that means in the key existed, or this value is the default value because the key doesn't exist. So in order to do that, the map give us a way to differentiate by returning optionally two values in which it can return either one value, which is the value you ask for the index, or two values, the value you ask for, and a Boolean value that tells you whether the key existed. So I've already looked up Jones, but I didn't store anything and I got nil. But I'll look it up again, and this time I'll look it up using the second return value to differentiate. When I do index m1 lookup Jones, it's returning two values. One would be the value stored at this key and whether or not that key existed. And if it's true, that means it existed. So we say not okay means that if this is false, means that it didn't exist. So not okay. So if this is hard to read, we can say if okay is equals to false, right? This says that this key doesn't exist in our map. So let's rerun it. And you can see now that this key doesn't exist on our map, which is exactly what we expect. That is looking up values in a map. And so we should make a note here that says this is lookup with confirmation. So that's what we're doing. We're checking to see if the key existed at the time we were looking up that value. The other thing we want to do is be able to calculate the length of a map. And as you can imagine, this is just going to be using the same built-in length function. And of course, we should expect to see just one because the only thing we stored was the Smith's information. Let's do new line. Okay, so, so nothing surprising there. The other thing we want to do is to be able to traverse a map. Let's say you had a thousand some elements in a map. You can't go through them in order because it's not like an area or slice. You don't know the key because somebody just gave you a map. So how do you iterate over it? Notice, oh, I'm using the range operator with my map, just like I use range operator slice or with strings or arrays and the for loop. But the difference here with maps, I am getting the key and value. Now you can range over a map and decide to ignore any one of these values, just we did like with the for loop. But in this case, I want both key and value. Of course, I could just range over, get the key, and then reuse that on the map. So let's run it. And no surprise, it should be exactly what we think it should be. Remember, if we run it multiple times, we'll get things in different order. So that's why you do not want to think about the order in which you put things in a map because it does not preserve the order in which you put it in. So make sure that all, if you're using a map, your solution or all you iterate over it does not depend on the order in which you put things in. So now we know how to iterate over a map. The last thing we said we're going to look at is how to delete element from a map. So let's say for our map, 
we want to delete the element that has the invalid value. We say the map we want to delete and the key. And in this case, it's minus one. Because remember, when we run our code just now, we had minus one as the key that has an invalid value. So that's the one we want to delete. And let's print our map out again. And notice all oh, that element is now gone from our map. And that's all you need to do to delete something from a map. So now we've covered everything we need to know about map. And again, the reason we're able to do this is because this looks so similar to what we did with array slices. There's one other thing that we didn't talk about. If you have an array, let's say and add an array A, that already allocates space so I can store elements in that array. If I store this now or copy it or assign it to another variable, what I have are two distinct arrays. So this is just reviewing again. So uh, let's do this. And the reason I'm going through this is because I want to show you something with maps that's similar to slices. So A and A2. Okay. So two distinct arrays, it's a copy. And that's why we talk about the inefficiency with arrays is that it's not efficient for the large data sets. It's convenient for certain things, but inefficient. We also saw that if you slice an array, as we know, you get a slice, you can have multiple slices. And when you assign them, it doesn't copy the underlying array, just pass around that reference, that piece of set of piece of data that points to the array. So we know that already. So I'm not going to show that again. What do you think is happening with a map? Let's create another map M2 and assign it M1. Now we know that M1 is already allocated. It has values in it. It has two values right now because we deleted the value. And if we should print out M2, we should expect to see the same thing that's in M1. So let's do that. So we're printing out M and sorry, M. I don't want M, M1. So if we print out M and M2, we should see that they have the same value. The question is, what happens when we use M2 to assign yet another value? This was integer as the index and the value was a string, which was a C plus or something. Can't remember. But now let's print it out again. We understand that at this point, they're both the same. So we expect this to print out the same thing. What we want to see now, is this going to be like arrays where a copy is made of that underlying data? But let's run it and see. As you can see, both maps got affected because map is like a slice in that it has this data structure that behind it is where all the data is stored. And so it is very efficient to pass around a map to a function because we know that when you do assignment like this or it's to a function or return from a function, it's a copy. So you're copying the map metadata essentially and not the actual map data. Just like when you copy a slice or you pass a slice from function to function or another variable, you're not doing a deep copy. If you remember, we talked about this, shallow copy versus deep copy. So when you do an assignment with map, you're doing a shallow copy, right? And that's why this is also efficient to use with, to have a large map and pass it around to a function or have it return from a function because you're not making a deep copy. That's it for section four. Have a great day. Take care. Bye. Your first exercise is to count the occurrence of each word in a text file. We haven't covered how to open a file and read from it. That's why I've given you new file reader function, which creates a file reader object. It's very simple to use. As you can see from the documentation, check it out. You know how to use packages now. So it's the input package that I've provided you before. So there's a function in there called new file reader. You give it a file name. And if the file exists, it will return to you a file reader object. On that file reader object, you can say read a line. It returns to you just a string. So now that you are able to get a line of text, and you can imagine if calling read line just return you one line, you want to do this repeatedly until there are no more lines. Once you have a line, you need to split the line of text into words. And for that, you'll use the string package and use the split function on the line that you read, you get back. And that breaks it up into words. That returns you a slice of strings. So you give it a string, it returns you a slice of string. The string you give it looks maybe let's say like this, and then it returns you a slice of string where each element of that slice is a word. And you of course tell it how you want to break that up. Usually you want to break it up by space because that's how in English at least we use space to delimit words. And then 
you want to be able to count those words. Let me run the solution, give you an idea what it looks like. Well, your data to be fed to your program is data.txt. So you can do go run and give it the data. We talked about passing arguments to your program already. And there you go. Now, of course, I could do go build to build my program. This gives me an executable. And then now I can run it on the Golang program itself. I can run it on the readme file itself, or I can run it on the data. And so there's an example. It tells you how many times each word occurred in that text. Lab two is very similar to lab one. You actually start with the code that you've written for lab one. The only difference is that we don't want to count noise words. Noise words are things like on, ah, uh, there, are, they just add noise. So we don't want to count those. So I'll give you some noise word and I want you to, there's an example of some of them. I want you to add more noise word that you can think of and then make sure that oh, if the text contain on versus on with a different case, that you still consider those noise words. So one tip to dealing with something like that is to use the to lower or the to upper function. You can think about how you might use this so that you can deal with the cases where noise word might appear with different cases. And when you run the program, it's going to look just like this, except is this a noise word. So if I were to go to solution two, I shouldn't expect to see is in my list, assuming that I add enough noise word, the obvious ones. So let's go to lab two. I'll build my program, for example, and the same exact text, I'll run it on data. And there we go. His is not in the list. I can run it on main that go i can run it on readme and there you go notice however that even though i can tell you that my noise word include r it didn't look specifically for r in quotes or on in quotes that's fine if you can think of how to deal with it i didn't want to make it complicated to tell you to deal with that and notice r slips through here because it's one of my noise word but it has a colon on the end of it so i miss things like that and obviously i missed ah 